Welcome to the Gospel Truth Show produced by Cross and Crown Radio. We want to make a lasting difference in your life and in our community. Our mission is to produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for God's people and folks all around the world. Post a comment or a question and sit back and enjoy the show. GospelTruthShow.Podbeam.com Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast. I'm Mike Robinson, your host. We're so glad that you're with us today. We've got a great topic. We're going to see how certain passages in the Bible that some have thought were difficult or have brought forth some gross misinterpretations, we're going to get in the right interpretation, including did Jesus know the time and the hour of his return? And if he didn't, does he still have all knowledge? Can he still be God without all knowledge? Also, we're going to talk about the evil eye. We're going to talk about... Uh, many other wonderful things uh, that people have sometimes misinterpreted, including Psalm 22, where Jesus quotes that and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can that be possible for God to completely, utterly forsake Jesus in his divinity? We're going to see that, and then we're going to see how the law plays out in our lives, among other things. Before we start, though, if you can, give us a subscription. That really, really helps. It's at the top of your uh, YouTube channel, if you're watching this via YouTube. We appreciate you being there, but subscribe. And here's a question of the day. What is the passage in the Bible that gives you the hardest problems of interpretation? What is it that you? it's very difficult for you to interpret? And we'll see if we can answer that for you. But leave that as a comment. Or give us some comments on some passages you think have been difficult or misinterpreted widely. And what you think might be the proper interpretation. Okay, so... The one that really bothers me a lot is there are some folks, uh, and they get this from guys that maybe taught 100 years ago when some of this teaching first came out, which is Jesus, when he died, went to hell. And there's, there's three main things that people say that teach this. Some say that Jesus went to hell and got beat up by the devil to help uh, our salvation. Two, that Jesus went down to hell and beat up the devil. So you get two different ideas of that. Uh, or three, that Jesus went down there, just kind of rested until the resurrection, then came forth. But Jesus went to the fiery hell to do something with the devil, or at least be in the fiery hell. And you get that from passages in First Peter and Ephesians that talk about Jesus descending. But in the, I'm not going to interpret those and exegete those passages for you today, but I'm going to show you why because the obvious clear passages are so clear that you don't even need to understand how to interpret those other passages properly. You can just say, and I'm not saying you should do this, but you could just say, well, I don't know the answer to that yet on those specific passages, but here's something really, really clear that we can know for sure happened when Jesus died. And so in Luke chapter 23 is where you want to go. Luke 23, when Jesus died, what happened? Where did Jesus go? The Bible makes it very, very clear where Jesus went, and it wasn't in the fiery hell. It wasn't in some place, a compartment to rest and, and to fight the devil or to get beat up or just to rest. Jesus went directly to the Father. He went directly to heaven, which is also called by the Jewish people in those days paradise. Luke 23 says this. Jesus, uh, this thief on the cross said this to Jesus. Verse 42, chapter 23. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So that's what the thief on the cross said to Jesus. And here's how Jesus responded in verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today, notice that, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there goes away soul sleep also for all of us. Because this thief just gets saved and he's going to go when he dies immediately to paradise, which is heaven. Uh, there's different words that are used for heaven. Abraham's bosom was one that the Jewish people used. The age to come was a reference uh, to directly or indirectly to heaven, and so was paradise. So just like we have different English words for the same thing, so do the Jewish people. So some theologians, some uh, non-scholars, they see these different wor words for paradise or for heaven, and they want to make them completely different than heaven. And that's, a, that's an error right off the bat, because we'll see why paradise has to be heaven. Because Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So Jesus, that day, is not going to hell. He's not going to Hades. He's not going to get beat up. He's not going to beat up the devil. He already beat the devil on the cross and brings a justification, vindication through his resurrection. That's going to come. But notice what he says. 
Now it was about the sixth hour, there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, the veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then he breathed his last. <laughs> Guess where he went? He went to the Father. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. See, that's very, very clear. Today you'll be with me in paradise. It's very, very clear. And you always want to interpret the unclear passages with the clear ones. So we read the text in Ephesians. Read the text in Peter. Jesus did not go to a fire hell to play games or beat up the devil or get beat up or to rest. He went to the Father. That's where his spirit went while his body's in the grave. It's very, very clear. And notice what it says in John chapter 21, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So he said, it is finished to tell us that it's completed. So he didn't need to go down to the hell and accomplish more work. He finished it on the cross to tell us that it's gone. It's completed, paid in full, done. Okay, so there's number one. Let's get another one. Did the Father separate from the Son? Now think about this. Ontologically, ontology is a study of being, the nature of things or people or, or entities. Ontology. The ontology of God is a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. So there's only one being, three persons, but one being. They cannot be separated because they're one being. Ontologically, it's impossible. It could never, ever happen. Yes, there's some things that God cannot do. God cannot make a, a circle a square. God cannot deny himself. God cannot lie. We know these things and more. So God cannot separate himself ontologically from the Son. Perhaps it's speaking to his, his human nature, if you want to go in that direction. But what Jesus was saying... In Matthew 27, we're going to read the text. It says, They crucified him and divided the garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled. They divided my garments among them. So that's what they did while Jesus is on the cross. There's two robbers crucified with him. Verse 30, 41, Likewise, the chief priest came mocking with the scribes and the elders, and he, he said, they said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he's a king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will. Because he said, I'm the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified reviled him. Now was the sixth hour until the ninth hour. There was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So there it is. There's where people run. They run with that statement and say, See, the father was separated. He abandoned Jesus. He turned his back on Jesus. Okay. Actually, God poured out the wrath and judgment upon Jesus on the cross. If you want to say in some sense, in a figurative way, that God turned away from the Son, uh, obviously God sees all things, so how can he do that anyways? But if you want to use a figurative way, that God turned away and is no longer looking upon the Son's humanity, perhaps you can say that. But Jesus is fully God and fully man. So why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's something called remnants. Remez is a very important topic to understand in the Bible. And Remez is a hinting at previous scripture. So when the rabbis would say a line from a, a book in the Bible, they would often say the first line in the book, referencing where you should turn in your mind, because not everybody was holding Bibles. They'd have to memorize these things and know where he was going to go. But in those days, the Bible books were not numbered and labeled. So keep that in mind. The whole book might be, but the chapters weren't. So what they would do is they would they would say the first line in that chapter to reference it for the uh, hearers to go to in their mind, or he would read the rest of the passage. So this remez, which is a rabbinical way of teaching in Jesus' day, you say the first line, and that means consider the rest of the passage also. So Jesus, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was referencing Psalm 22. Now that's amazing. Why Psalm 22? Because Psalm 22 is a crucifixion psalm. It predicted the crucifixion of Jesus a thousand years before it happened, including all the things we just read about them, dividing the, their garments, them mocking Jesus, them uh, uh, turning their back on him, gambling for his clothes, all the 
those things were mentioned in Psalm 22 as well as they pierced my hands and my feet. That was written a thousand years before it happened, which is one of the over 300 predictions about Jesus that were written before he was born and they all came true in his life. Let me read you Psalm 22 and you'll know why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says this, and Psalm 22 starts with verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See how it is? That's what he was referencing with remez. Remez. It's a biblical or rabbinical way of interpreting scriptures and even labeling the books of scripture. But I am a worm, no man, a reproach of man, despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot their lip at me, shaking their head. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him. See, all those things were actually coming true while Jesus was being crucified. So he's saying, guys, hey, look, Psalm 22, it's happening right before your eyes. What was predicted about the Messiah a thousand years ago before they even invented the form of, of uh, execution as crucifixion. Before crucifixion was even invented, this psalm was written. And so they laughed me to scorn. And then it says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are spread apart. You can see the crucifixion unfolding. All my bones are spread apart. My heart is like wax, which is what's what's happening inside i poured out like water all my bones are spread apart or excuse me i already read that in the midst of my bowels you brought me into the dust of death for the dogs have encircled me dogs is a term often used for gentiles so the romans have encircled jesus the band of spoilers have hemmed me in that's what the romans had done and notice what the romans did they pierced my hands and my feet wow that's amazing so Jesus was not uh, given up by God the Father and separated. You can't separate the Father from the Son. Okay? Jesus was saying, yes, this thing, thing called the crucifixion is horrible because of propitiation. You can see my video on that if you don't know what that means. All the judgment, all this wrath poured out into Jesus, and, and Jesus taking all the sin of man, but he was not separated from God the Father and touching his God. That would be impossible. Now, did Jesus know the timing of his second coming? Some people say no. And so that Jesus did not know all things. Now, there's a fairly easy uh, way to resolve that. And that would be saying, well, in touching Jesus' humanity, he didn't know all things. But in touching his divinity, he did. So that's, that's a real good answer. And that's what most people say. But let's see, maybe there's something even fuller than that. In Mark 13, 32, it says, But the day and the hour knows no one, not the angels, nor the Son, but only the Father. So that's what Jesus said. And then in John 2, 24, it says, But Jesus did not commit himself to them, for he knew all. Now the word men is in parentheses, but it's not there in the Greek. So John chapter 12, chapter 2, verse 24, says Jesus knew all. He knew everything. If you want to say, well, men should be in there, but it's not. Knowing all men still requires omniscience, because there's billions and billions of men. Okay? So he has all uh, omniscience. And had no need of anyone to testify him. Notice before he knew what was in man. So Jesus knew that. John 16, 30. Now we know for sure you, Jesus, know all things. So there it is. John 14. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. I come again and receive you to myself. That where I am you may be also. And where I go you will know. That's a phrase that's similar to some of the religious the religious marriage ceremonies in the first century Judaism. So Jesus is saying something about his second coming that seems to be related to uh, marriage. And what's interesting is there was one form in, in Palestine where uh, the, the, the groom would ask the, the uh, bride and the father if she would marry him. If she said yes and drank the cup, signifying yes and took the, the covenant, he'd tell her, I have to go away and prepare a place for you, for where I am you'll be, and when my father inspects it and says, he gives me basically the thumbs up, then I can come and get you. But I don't know the day or the hour, only my father knows. So he'd go back to his place and, and build it really, really well because the father would inspect it. He couldn't be, build a shabby shack just to rush off to get his bride. He had to build something with quality because his father would have to approve. After the father approved it, he could go get his bride. He would go sometimes at night like a thief in the night. Sound familiar? He'd go with a trumpet blast when he got near her house to warn her and with a shout. You can see all those things related to the second coming of Jesus. So Jesus 
was re perhaps relaying about this little kind of a true to life parable that you know what we don't need to talk about my second coming remember the marriage the way the marriages work that the son goes and prepares a place but he doesn't know the timing of when it is but the, only the father knows so that's part of the interpretation of why Jesus perhaps didn't know the day or the hour of his coming perhaps he actually really did and he was just saying hey think of this this marriage the way that the marriage uh, works out in first century Palestine or it could be in touching his humanity now what about the evil eye so many crazy interpretations you hear from people because the evil eye or your eye that's evil that Jesus talks about in occult circles <clears throat> could mean like you're gonna put some kind of spell on somebody or some wicked spiritual thing but that's not what Jesus is talking about let's look at that in Matthew 6 verse 1 take heed that you do your charitable deeds notice how he starts this this section out before men to be seen by them therefore uh, verse 2 when you do your charitable deed he talks about it again and he gives outline not to blow a trumpet and when you do your charitable deed says it says it again in verse 3 do it in secret and when you pray you shall not be like hypocrites standing up and then in verse 19 he says do not lay up yourself treasures on earth see the topic the topic is giving it's generosity or being stingy he says so you lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in to steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust will neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal notice what he says for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the lamp of your the lamp of your body is your eye therefore your eye is good your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is evil your whole body will be full of darkness you cannot serve two masters um, you cannot serve God and money so see the section it's all about giving charity and money and then he talks about the bad eye or the evil eye in first century rabbinic thought that was a term for being stingy being one who's not charitable so Jesus is saying don't be super cheap don't be stingy but be a giver the givers are those with good eyes they're giving people they're charitable the non-charitable people the ungiving people are those with an evil eye or a bad eye okay so there's another one now there's other people in our modern society that say I hate religion and I know what they mean because I say things similar to that but not to that that strength because I hate religion that tries to make itself uh, accepted by God I can do all these religious acts so I'm accepted by God no that's false it's about faith in Jesus that he died for you and rose again and having that covenant relationship with him but it's faith alone because of grace alone through Christ alone that we're saved okay so it's not based on religion so in that sense I agree and I would say that many times but you have to leave some caveats on that and a chief one is this that religion is important it just can't save you religion is important and essential it can't save you and it can't keep you saved and it can't make you accepted by God how do we know that James chapter 1 verse 27 pure and undefiled religion did you catch that religion before God and Father is this visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and keep one on oneself unspotted from the world okay so that's what good religion is undefiled religion so religion can't save you it's not to be sought off in the sense of I want to go to heaven because I'm, I'm a religious person yet there's aspects of religion that we must do not to get saved not to stay saved but because we're saved okay now how about the father being uh, uh, better than Jesus notice the term I use you'll never see that in scripture but when, when Jesus says a father is greater than I some cult leaders say in cults say look the father is better than Jesus ontologically he's different and better and greater than Jesus Jesus wasn't saying that because Jesus said greater not better if he was talking about his ontology he'd say better but see if I went to court and I went there and I had a ticket the judge in the courtroom is greater than me but he's not better than me okay when you walk into our church the elders are greater than you in authority but they're not better than you okay the husband is greater than the wife but not better than the wife they're equally they're equal in speaking on their ontology on their being on their on their nature okay so they're equal 
And same with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus became a servant. And so in touching his humanity, in his servanthood, the Father is greater than Jesus. Okay? But Jesus also said, the Father, and I, and I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. That's what Jesus said. I could never say that. An angel could never say that. A prophet could never say that. You could never say that in the sense of it being true. No one could say that as a true statement except for Jesus. Okay, so the Father is greater in the sense Jesus came as a servant, but he's not better as touching his nature. Jesus is fully God. The Father is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God. There's one God. Three persons and one God. Now, is it justifi justification by grace? Well, James chapter 2, let's see. Well, we've got a few more of these. So you know what? We're going to save that for another time. And, and understand this, that we are here for you. We don't want you to be here for us. But we're here for you. Uh, and what I mean by that is we're here to serve you. If you have any questions, any comments, uh, let us know in the comments section on the YouTube channel or the Facebook or the other media. Or email us at mroblv at gmail.com. mroblv at gmail.com. We're also calling young men, maybe even old, to come out to Granbury, Texas. Beautiful town, wonderful town. If you have a call on your life for evangelism, if you're an evangelist, or if you're a, um, an apologist, or if you're a pastor, if you want to get into licensed ministry and go forth, maybe plant a church, come out to Granbury. We will train you, and we will set you, and get you going so that you can do these ministries that God has called you to. But we will train you. If you think you're already trained, come out anyways. I think we'll still be able to teach you some things and help you get going in your ministry. But you can uh, email us at mroblv at gmail.com. If you're interested in that and if you don't know Jesus this is your opportunity in Luke 18 the tax collector standing far off said to God oh father be merciful to me a sinner and Jesus said that man went home justified the Bible says in Romans 10 9 if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you shall be saved that means you'll be a Christian you'll be accepted by God if that's real if God by God's grace through faith because of Christ alone, if that's occurred in your heart, then you are saved. And so what you do is you cry out to God, Father, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for all my sins, and I profess that God raised him from the dead. This is what I believe. I receive him as Lord and Savior in my life. I will walk with him all the days of my life. If you've come to that place, you've confessed that to God and believe in your heart, then get involved in a really good church. Read your Bible every day. And you can contact us, let us know that it's occurred. And we will help you in sending materials. And until next time, this is Pastor Mike Robinson saying, may God bless you. Hey guys, please subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. Additionally, don't forget to join our full access media experience. We want you to know that Cross and Crown full access is now available for just $7.99 a month. Full Access provides an enjoyable Christian media experience. Every day we produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for you on demand. Sign up for Cross and Crown Full Access and get every television show, the after show, a free book monthly, and all our academic work at your command. All just one click away at gospeltruthshow.podbean.com. Help us reach the world.